Welcome, everyone. And I am so grateful that Suzanne is continuing to in, entertain us in wonderful ways. Today, we're, we're doing spring. You know, we are already one third of the way done with this year, know. with May just around the corner and May Day approaching on Sunday. So it's our pleasure to host these art and meditation events sponsored by, well, actually sponsored by Suzanne and me. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty much. <laughs> Pretty much. <laughs> you can catch our previous soirees on uh, our YouTube channel. Just Google, just go to Capital City Unity and Google cocktails, mocktails, art and meditation. And, and it comes right up. It comes right up a little, and uh, as does all the ones that we've done in the past that I've remembered to record. <laughs> um, so today's uh, presentation, as I mentioned, is on the art of spring. And we really did have to shove this in pretty quickly before the temperatures and <laughs> went to summer <laughs> as did the days. Yeah. Um, Suzanne, thanks so much for the time that you spend putting this together and researching it and then educating us. I know I speak for everyone when I say you are a wonderful, wonderful storyteller. Oh, you thank, the you. Best. thank you. So, oh, yes. thank, thank you. you. <laughs> thank you. Yeah. My pleasure. Um, so now for the woman, to the woman who cur cur curates it all. <laughs> curates. <I> curates it all. <laughs> okay. Well, let's start with this gorgeous piece. Spring in California just wouldn't be spring unless there were wild poppies and lupin. Lupins. Yep. And California state flower uh, is, is the poppy. And I don't think there's anywhere in the state that the poppy isn't. And combined with the brilliant blue of the lupin, the colors are just unbeatable. They truly are an impressionist artist, perfect combination. So we've seen John Marshall Gamble's work before. Um, and like many of the artists that time, painting poppies became a passion and a livelihood for him. Uh, around 1906, uh, the California legislature named the poppy as the state flower. And Gamble, like some of his other artist friends, made a significant decision of, uh, 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 of the artistic life. He began painting poppies and poppies and poppies. And that's because that's what sold, what, that's what the tourists wanted to bring home from the Golden State as a souvenir, poppies. And really, can you blame them? Now, Claudia and I were talking earlier and Claudia, you, I think you did some research and you have some information on how the poppies became widely, state, statewide, all over. Oh you yes, see I, them was, all I over. was telling Suzanne about a, a huge poppy patch that we have right near um, Ralph's parents' home and it's along the railroad tracks, but it's just massive. And what we learned is, is that when the legislature approved the poppy as the state flower, they gave, they had sacks upon sacks of poppy seeds um, handed out to the railroad companies yeah. and had them, the, you know, the caboose guy, throw them off the back of the train so that wherever the train tracks were, poppies would grow. And you know, when you think about it, a lot of travel at the time was by train. And, then, and when Suzanne was saying that these people were taking, you know, taking souvenirs back, uh, you know, Sunset Magazine was developed just to be a promotion for the railroads that were bringing people east to California. So. Um, I thought that was interesting. Just, it, just it, like it really is. Poppies. And that's why we see poppies from the mountains to the coast, to the desert, to the forest. It, they, they're an incredibly gorgeous plant and they do represent the golden state. So, and speaking of California lupin, or as Texas calls them, the bluebells, let's go to our next one. And this is such a lovely, sweet piece. It's, you know, if you look dotted among the lupin are the ever present poppies, but it, it's, it's this velvet softness of the lupin that takes center stage 
and makes this piece by the artist Percy Gray really a, a timeless snapshot of California's spring in the Great Central Valley. And is just what it's, he's done is he has this more velvety gray green palette of the hills and it beautifully frames that blue, purple, and white of the lupin. And uh, this is a phenomenal watercolor. You'd think it's, it is oil, but it is not. It is a gorgeous watercolor. And the thing is so wonderful about this, it's just this moment in time because by June, it's pretty much dry and brown. And that's where California gets its golden state from is that the hills become golden color, although they look brown to me, but golden. <laughs> but isn't this amazing before I go on this, that, that it's actually watercolor? Yeah. It's so spectacular. Just... It is. And when you see it in person, you really can see the layering of the, of the watercolors. And it is a true skill to do watercoloring because it is not a forgiving uh, medium at all. Okay. So you know what happens every spring like clockwork in a place, Southern California, and that's the return of the cliff swallows to Mission San Juan Capistrano. So every St. Joseph's Day in March, people gather to celebrate the return of the cliff swallows from their 6,000 mile journey from Argentina. 6,000 miles, they leave in October, they fly 6,000 miles to Argentina, and then they return in March. Pretty amazing, pretty good frequent flyer miles too. So the legend of this, it has it that the swallows took refuge in, the, in Mission San Juan Capistrano from an irate innkeeper who destroyed their muddy nests. They build these nests under the eaves. And Father St. John O'Sullivan, who was the pastor of the mission uh, at that time intervened and he personally invited the swallows to nest at the mission and which they did according to the legend the next day. So the swallows return to the old room church each spring and they know they will be protected within the mission walls. The San Juan Capistrano is the seventh of the chain of 21 missions in California and the most recognizable feature of this mission is the distinctive bell wall, which you see here, and it houses four bells. You see only three here. There's a fourth one on the far left, and it's because of the way the, the, the perspective is. Um, and, it, and these four bells used to hang from the campanile in the great stone church, which was destroyed in 1812 um, earthquake. And I actually think the artist who is write, author writer captures this very intimate alcove with the bells perfectly. And a little bit about Arthur Ryder. He was born in Chicago. Um, he of course received his training uh, early at the Chicago Academy of Fine Arts. And then like most artists went to Paris to study uh, at several of the academies. And in 1911, he heard a lecture by the Spanish artist Joaquin Sorolla. And the writer then was enamored and he set off to Spain. He befriended Sorolla and then spent nine consecutive summers in Spain painting with him. And after Sorolla died, writer returned to Chicago and bounced back and forth uh, between Chicago and California. And then he eventually rented a house in Laguna Beach and continued painting. Um, what was also interesting, and like many artists, he made uh, money painting scenery sets for MGM and 20th Century Movie Studios. He loved Southern California, and part of it was because of the Spanish history and the style of the architecture. And he was especially fond of the gardens and the architecture of Mission San Juan Capistrano. And he did something interesting. Most of the artists of that time or the generation before him um, depicted the missions in total, in whole. And what he did was he focused only on the essence of the mission, these small little fragments of light and color like we see in this piece, these very intimate studies that he did. And um, this is just a gorgeous, gorgeous piece and a, like a moment in time. And of course, harking the spring with the return of the uh, swallows. 
Okay. So Suzanne, if you go to San Juan Capistrano or, or anybody else, I have never been there. Is this is this accurate? Is this what you would see? Yes, the bells are still there. Yeah, and, the and you can see are? the the ruin of the great uh, the great um, ch um, stone church where it's collapsed, and then they've re they've built um, a, they've built a new new uh, church, but uh, um, they the ruins are are there and they didn't try to re, uh, rebuild it. They just left it there. So yes, this is what you'll see. We also were doing a little bit of talking before the, cause we run through these beforehand and um, you all probably didn't know this, but uh, the missions are, the 21 missions are 30 miles apart, mas or menos, and it represents a day's ride by horse. So a long that, day's ride. <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> or a three-day walk was what the, what the article said. Yeah, interesting. Okay, thanks, Claudia. So what else is oh. very much spring in California are irises. And there's, to me, there's nothing more spring than the irises. They are some of the first flowers to pop out. And I think Claudia, you got some right behind you. I do. And I, I went and, and picked it, them tonight for yeah. Hour. And I think everyone who has a, a yard in Sacramento region has irises in their yard. And uh, you know what? And we look at this piece, and what's really stunning about this, when you look at the this is porcelain, mm -hmm. is that how much it gives the look of blown glass. Yeah. And that's because of the master work. Of Franz Bischoff, yeah, I actually I am in love with his work. He's as a ceramicist. He's also a painter, and we have seen some of his paintings in previous uh, tours. Um, he is known as the King of the Rose Painters, mm -hmm. and uh, he was very unique uh, among early California impressionists because his early training in the decorative arts that he acquired in glass and porcelain studies in, his, in studios in his uh, native country, which is now the Czech Republic, um, was different than many of the other, most of the other uh, plein air or impressionists because they all had backgrounds in illustration and academic art schools, but he, he did not. And because he was a ceramicist and started painting, he focused a lot on these beautiful color harmonies and creating pleasing shapes. Um, when he was 12, he began a three-year apprenticeship at the local craft school and um, then came to the United States when he was 18 and he worked in China factories uh, painting lamp and then he moved to painting lampshades at a glass factory. But he began prospering and then and then and started taking these special orders and teaching classes that were popular and they were always full, especially with women who it was uh, acceptable to take uh, China painting at that time. Uh, it, by the mid 1890s, Bischoff fame as a master porcelain painter was reaching nationwide proportions and he was considered an impressionist China painter. And as you can see here, in this extraordinary vase that he really captured the essence and the form of his natural subjects, which were flowers. Um, what I find interesting about his work is that he always started with a layer of grays, mm. which is something I would never have thought. And he added stronger colors as he worked. He, he told his students that it, you would only become an artist when you learn the importance of gray. So having a Bischoff vase was a, a social necessity for the well-to-do family in the 1890s. And they actually cost a considerable amount. But uh, according to many of his students, a Bischoff vase could be had for a lot less if you enrolled in one of his classes. So uh, he moved to Pasadena in 1906, and then he continued painting flowers throughout his life. He eased away from the China painting and transferred this incredible sense of color and design technique to painting landscapes. And uh, the commission, the Crocker is very fortunate to have uh, a number of his landscapes and they are glorious. 
Any any comments or questions about this oh. particular piece? It is spectacular. There's so much depth. It's like it's 3D. It, you're right, <laughs> Melissa. You're absolutely right. And uh, as I say, when I first saw that in the case, I thought it was a blown glass yeah. boss. Beautiful. It is absolutely stunning. Okay, you know, people ask us sometimes when we're giving tours if we have any pieces by a really famous artist like Renoir. And yes, we do. The Crocker does have some Renoir. So let's go to our next piece, Claudia. There we go. I know there's two Renoirs, but in a medium that we don't usually associate with um, Pierre Auguste Renoir. Um, and let me talk about Renoir a bit uh, first. He was trained as a painter of porcelain actually, uh, but he was always inspired by the works of the old masters. And he was 20 and he entered uh, this studio of a very famous uh, history painter, painter of history scenes, Charles Glenier. And most of us don't know or remember who Charles Glenier is, However, they remember many of his students who included Renoir and James Whistler and Claude Monet. So working with these colleagues it really heightened Renoir's interest in light effects and these very loose brush strokes. So by the 1860s, guess what was emerging in France? And that's working with Claude Monet, they led to the development of this new impressionist style. So, Renoir's greatest fame came in the 1870s and the 1880s when the Impressionist style hit its peak. Um, and he, then he really still continued to innovate. He traveled to North Africa and Italy during this period and started doing a lot more classical work. But the question is, why did Renoir move from painting to terracotta? Well, er, later in his life, uh, as his hands became somewhat paralyzed from rheumatoid arthritis. It, it, and it, although he still painted, it made it more challenging for him. And he couldn't pick up a brush. His assistant had to put the brush in his hand and they had to uh, use um, claws to kind of bandage his hand to keep him from bruising himself against uh, the canvases. But he started working with clay and he said, that the clay enfolded his hands. And um, he began creating these terracottas, which were later uh, in some cases and terracotta statues, and then they were cast in bronze. But these two, the tambourine dancer and the flute player um, really personify spring. They celebrate the song and dance. And as you can see, it really harkens back to that classical Greek style that he always loved. And um, I, if you look really close at the flute player, what's interesting is the flute player is missing the flute. Yeah. Renoir never made the flute. Oh. And I don't know why. <laughs> maybe he intended to, uh, or maybe it was a suggestion, but um, I don't know. But these two pieces uh, were some of the last works he produced before he died in 1919. So yes, the Crocker does have some Renoirs. Interesting enough. All right. Let's move to this next piece. And this is called The Joyous Garden. And it is joyous. It's a riot of blooms. How could you not be happy or peaceful or content strolling through this garden? And although it actually, there's some very amazing technique in this painting that we can analyze, it's just a joy to behold as a painting. And it's, at, it's one of uh, Crocker's newer acquisitions. Uh, the artist uh, Benjamin <laughs> Chambers Brown was um, a transplant to California by way of Arkansas. And then he came, went to Texas and then he jumped over to Paris and then came to California. But he loved, he really loved California. And he was very active in the art societies in Southern California. 
He was trained as uh, in etching, as an etcher. And he and his brother Howell founded the Printmakers uh, Society of California. And they sponsored these incredible annual international print ex exhibitions from the, all over the countries all over the world brought their, brought their prints. Um, he was an avid impressionist and he was pretty outspoken um, in his criticism of any other style of art. So he embraced impressionism and that's what he did. Um, he had pa patrons in California and he had patrons on the East Coast. And uh, one New York dealer though suggested that Brown open a studio there and conceal the fact that he was from California would make him more sophisticated, more valuable. And he said, no, he flatly refused. And he defiantly began painting the word California beneath his signature. And this one says, I believe Cal Pasadena, California in it. Did you see that Claudia? We were looking earlier. Yeah. He was affirming his pride in being a California. So, um, and like many California artists, Brown also became famous or well-known for his poppy paintings. Now, uh, this piece, particular piece in recent acquisition was sold last year uh, at auction for $119,000. Now the Crocker didn't pay that for it. It was bought, purchased by uh, a couple who collects art and donates much of it to the Crocker. Um, and this piece was, as I said, acquired in 2021. And it is a joy indeed. Okay, so let's, uh, here we go. The water spirit, the water or water sprite. It's also referred by some as the spring sprite. So, but everything, everything about this bronze piece just, just re, in, in, is, is movement and her hair, yes, sprites were considered female. Uh, it's flowing about her head like, like water. She's dancing and movement in her long limbs. They're in motion. And she, she actually looks like a plume of water that's you know, spurting up from the, from the ground. And what's, you know, what's more spring than water? You know, water brings new life to the earth. And the water sprite, uh, is a benevolent force of life and creation, and, it re and they revitalize the barren winter world. This, this is uh, almost four feet tall, so it's quite an, a, a nice size, and it is actually lovely. And um, the artist, Leo Lentelli, was, who was born in Italy, studied as a sculpture. He immigrated to the U.S. At, when he was 24, and his career took off, and he was chosen to provide sculptural ornament for the Panama uh, Pacific Expo in California in 1950. And this is one of his water sprites. And they used them to make very striking fountain statues. And the reason he, he did this so well is that he left the surface, some of the surface rough for texture and to give this effect of spontaneity and movement. And when the water hits it, it bounces off these pieces as, and it looks like the sprites are dancing. And it is a really a glorious piece. Um, uh, Lentelli returned to New York to teaching and providing, and then went on to provide dozens of reliefs and statues for buildings throughout the East Coast including statues for the U.S. Post Office and um, bas reliefs on the International Building at the Rockefeller Center. So he was doing this a lot during the work, um, the work program, the government work program during the Depression. So a lot of the artists were put to work doing these beautiful pieces. All right. The WPA. The WPA, thank you. Works, the works program administration, I guess it was. There were a couple of different ones. But. All right, let's, let's look at this piece. You know, if colors alone of this glass piece don't make you think of spring, mm -hmm. and perhaps the shape reminds you of a blossom bursting forward, ready to unf unfurl. It looks 
to me some like a a peony or a tulip that's ready to explode. Um, this is the glass work of Marvin um, uh, Lepofsky. And uh, it's some, you know, critics have called it provocative, his work provocative or sensual or fluid, and it's visually interesting and actually really irresistible to touch. I mean, I, any, there's pieces of glass in the Crocker that I have a hard time not touching. I really have to walk away because it just invites you to run your hand over the surface of it. Um, you know, some describe his pieces as luscious. And I think this series called Chico Spring uh, is really scrumptious. It's in color and in texture. Um, uh, Lepofsky was a, a glass blowing pioneer and he was really at the forefront of the then what they call it the underground international studio glass movement in the late 1960s and early 70s. Uh, and he is considered one of the most important founders uh, in the American studio glass movement. Um, he introduced it to California when he became an instructor at the University of California, Berkeley, and then at the California College of Arts and Crafts where he founded the glass program. What's intriguing about this piece though, and, and most of his work, he, he did these colorful bubbles of glass and they are often semi-translucent. So you can't see through them, but they allow the viewer to examine and look inside and you get a very interesting cast of light and, and dark. Um, his work really is about the art of glass blowing and in the ways in which a, a blown glass sphere can be opened and shaped and distorted like a, you know, kind of like a bursting bubble or a blossom or a break apart egg. He, he really embodied what glass is known for and it's this momentary quality that can, can feel like it's, it's there one minute and, and gone the next. So, why did he call this Chico Spring series? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't been able to find. <laughs> well, you're asking us. Huh? <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I, I don't know. I haven't been able to find why he called this Chico Spring series. Um, he did uh, a California color series. He did a California dark series. He did a Pilchuck summer series, Pilchuck was Dale Chihuly's um, glass blowing uh, 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 foundry in Washington. He did a Stockholm series. He did a Laucha group and a China group. It seems everywhere he traveled and studied, he worked. And that really impacted the colors he used and some of, some of the shape and movement that he did use these glass bubbles. Um, he, he was the first American to do a series of glass sculptures in China <coughs> and Czechoslovakia. So this is just an extraordinary piece and, and just a lot of beautiful spring color and movement. So is it bowl-like? Is it bowl-like? Yeah. It's, yeah, it's, well, it, it's, it's not a bowl or it's kind of a vessel, but it's open in some parts and some parts it's, it's, it's like a bowl that's been ripped and collapsed, like a big bubble is what it's like that's been ripped and collapsed. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you go online and look at some of his work, it is extraordinary. And he all tends to work with this bubbly shape, but the colors are just extraordinary. And some feel like they fold in on each other and um, some look like they're exploding. And he, he, it's blown and shaped and etched and sand and sanded. I mean, he works this glass every which way. Anyway, it, it is a lovely, lovely piece. <laughs> Let's move to our next one. And some might recognize this. I, I, we may have used it before in one of our, our, um, tours, but it is well worth looking at again. And 
several years ago, the Crocker had a retrospective of Chura Obata's work. Oh, yeah. And <laughs> it was stunning. His, his attention to detail, his technique, his superb control of the brush is absolutely breathtaking. And the Maiden of Northern Japan, which is this piece, is really an ode to the first blossoms of spring. Um, we could spend a whole, we could, we could spend one whole tour just on his work. It is so stunning. But um, a little about him and that he, he, was, he returned to his birthplace in uh, Sendai, Japan, it's, um, he emigrated um, in 1928 for his father's funeral. And it was actually the first time since he emigrated to the US in 1903 that he had gone back to Japan. And he started the piece there in 1928. He returned to San Francisco uh, later uh, and he lived in the San Francisco Bay area and he completed it in 1931 at the San Francisco Art Association um, in front of an audience. So for a week, he demonstrated his technique using the Japanese design traditions to finish the painting before a very enthusiastic audience. And the, you know, it takes a, somebody with a lot of not only confidence and dedication, but it was his mastery of ink on silk. This is, a, it's on silk. Mm -hmm. And if you think watercolors are unforgiving, silk is notoriously unforgiving and it allows for no mistakes. Uh, he, he depicts this delicate, delicate beauty of this young woman wearing a casual silk kimono with striped design that was very common at that time. And the blooming magnolia tree, um, and suggestion of a peony or a butterfly on the obi or her sash kind of adds elements of spring to this everyday wear. All these, the kimono's lines and the, and the stripes are all painted freehand and they were all done with absolute precision. Uh, I, I would have loved, loved to have seen him paint this, but uh, uh, just an extraordinary artist. And this is an extraordinary piece, also quite large, almost four feet tall. Gorgeous piece of art. Okay, let's move on. I'm thinking on. of the gray background that uh, Bischoff used. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> he, that's where he started. It was interesting. Now, I don't know. I don't think he did that with his he may have done it with his oil paintings when he went, but certainly on his ceramics pieces, they started with gray, which is kind of an unusual, an unusual, but maybe that is truly, I'm not an artist, but maybe that is truly where you get a neutral color to build on. You know, Suzanne, this is Pam, and I didn't know what pieces you had picked and what a nice variety to represent spring. Oh, thanks, Pam. Well, we, Pam and I did a walk through at the Crocker a couple of weeks ago, I think, and we were looking at pieces for for spring and thinking about, you know, there's a lot of lot of pieces that you could use. But um, thank you, Pam. This, these were just a few kind of of my favorites. It's all, they're always my favorites. <laughs> why, why else would I choose them? Okay. Yeah, and I don't have a say in them, so no, you don't. Favorite. No, you don't. <laughs> I get a veto uh, rights. I, I sometimes kind of say, eh, but. Yeah, well, that's when I get really a lot of them. So, <laughs> all right, let's go to our, our next piece. And I think spring actually wouldn't be complete without showing a Southwest pottery piece. The American Indians of the Southwest began, as we've, we've talked about this before uh, in the, uh, Southwest Dynasty uh, tour. Uh, they made pottery at least 2000 years ago and they passed these skills from generation to generation. And it was almost always grandmother, mother, aunt, to aunt, to daughter, to niece, to any other female family member. And the Native Americans view that all things, whether they're living or inanimate, possess a spirit. And that's what drives this language of symbols. And this pot 
um, called the dragonfly pot was made in the traditional uh, way using uh, coiled ropes of clay and wood fired kilns. And it requires great skill to do this. And um, the artists consider that these pots are living, that they have a spirit and that they are breathing as well. Um, there's a lot, th these artists have a very deep emotional and spiritual investment in the land and connection to the land. So these repots reflect this. Um, and in, in the world of Native American art, and, and it's at other cultures too, the symbols are passed from generation to generation. So when I talk about a symbol, I'm generalizing what their meaning is because some Pueblos or some tribes might have a different meaning for a different symbol. But this particular um, uh, symbol, you know, there, um, uh, was an, uh, is the dragonfly. And um, some, sometimes the symbols are associated with maybe uh, simplicity or a struggle of everyday life. They're certainly spiritual or combination of both. They, many of the symbols are, are related to water. In the desert, water is, 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 is a life force. Uh, rain and snow, wood, uh, foodstuffs and animals, they're, whether they were both domestic or wild. Um, so they, they were very personal and, and adapted to their own style. This particular pot, the dragonfly pot, was created by Autumn Bortz Meddock. And she is from the Santa Clara Pueblo in New Mexico. Now the, Santa, the pot makers of Santa Clara, Santa Clara Pueblo are known for the black pottery. And like this one, deeply carved. So they're some of the Pueblos make very thin uh, walls of the pot and they paint on them or they etch on them. Others like the Santa Clara and actually pretty much only the Santa Clara, they make their pots thicker and then they carve out or they, the, the design. So what you're seeing is light, the dark and the light that's all carved. So the actual exterior was the darker, the light inside is the carved out bit. Um, the dragonfly, the meaning basically it encourages, encourages forward movement. It's, it's, it also represents a freedom and it's a symbol of resurrection and rebuilding after hardships, which is what spring is. And as we look at this incredible piece, I, I wanna point out that the pot, this pot is not glazed. The gloss is not a glaze, but it's rather done by burnishing the clay before firing. And they burnish it using a smooth rock or a bone or a piece of wood. And, uh, and, and then it's fired. So if this were the, one of their well-known black pots, the vessel would be put into the kiln and at a, at a certain time, it would be smothered with horse or sheep manure, and that would cut off all the oxygen and then oxi oxidize the pot, making it black. We take it out and wipe it off, and it's this gorgeous black, onyx black pot. It's absolutely beautiful. And that's what the Santa Clara um, Pueblo was known for, that and the deep carving of the, of the pots. So I really, I'm, I'm looking at this pot and I'm really um, impressed or intrigued with how the lower symbols looking like crosses are actually kind of stylized dragonflies, or it looks to me like they're sty stylized dragonflies, um, emulating the ones that are directly above it. That's no. a good observation. You're absolutely right. And I'm sure that this was Autumn's stylization of the dragonfly. So it's her interpretation of them. Absolutely right, Claudia. But it also it, looks like a cross. It does. It, 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 it does. I, I think with the double wings, though, it, yeah. <laughs> it, uh, 
it, it is, but it, it, it's almost a, a, a reflection of the, of, the, um, of the dragonfly above, and it's almost re reflected in the lower portion of that. And then, you know, as you can see above, you can see little, little steps that look like little steps on the top right-hand side. Um, yeah. Those are most likely what they call Kiva steps. And the Kiva was the sacred ceremonial um, room where um, the, the uh, tribal elders went. And the three steps uh, represent birth, life, and death. So it was very, very sacred. And most of the, uh, the Pueblos and most of the Native Americans of, of that region had some sort of a Kiva step uh, symbol or representation. Um, the one on the kind of left that looks jagged, um, that could be a uh, kind of more of an interpretation of a bear claw, or it could be or could be rain or or weather. I don't. I'm not sure what autumn was intending, but bear claws were very important and very symbolic because bears uh, were strength, but also brought brought water. They were uh, a very personal totem for many of the Native Americans. Okay, so let's go ahead and end our spring tour tonight with the artist William Clapp's Tree in Blossom. Now, this to me is spring captured in a moment. And you might look at this work and think, oh, it's Claude Monet or Georges Seurat. And you would be right. Um, it is Impressionist style. Uh, William Clapp was born in Montreal. He moved to California when he was six and then returned to Montreal for study, uh, uh, followed by more years of study at several academies in Paris. Uh, he was heavily influenced by the Impressionism uh, at that time, and his style was kind of a, transformed into his own personal Impressionist style. So we kind of combined that Monet Seurat pointillism. Um, he, um, he became very well known for these brilliant, um, high, high, highly colored landscapes that kind of were inspired by Monet. Um, he brought this impressionist style back to Montreal um, and it was pretty much to mixed or uncomprehending uh, reactions from the critics and the public. They weren't really impressed with it. So he left Montreal, he moved to Cuba for several years, and then he finally settled in Oakland, California, where he found like-minded and brethren painters. And um, with them, he founded uh, what was called the Society of Six. And they were a group of artists who painted outdoors and socialized and exhibited together in and around Oakland, uh, California. Um, it, you know, his paintings were just bright and they were unexpected and they were vibrant. And you, and you can almost feel the softness of that spring air and smell the blossoms um, in, from this painting. And uh, it is truly a lovely, vibrant piece and uh, uh, a great way to end tonight's tour. Um, his, his works are still reasonably priced. You could pick up one and for under $8,000. So if you have a mind to, you can go on to any of the auction houses that have them and probably bid and get it. <laughs> so Claudia, I'm, I think our tour is done here and I'm gonna turn it over to you for our ending meditation so we can have a nice spring thought before we, before we leave each other tonight. All right, thank you, Suzanne. And thank You're you for welcome. that beautiful tour. So yeah, it's so enriching for the soul. I, I hope um, I hope you feel that because I know I do. And now as we move into that place of meditation, I chose this beautiful, beautiful painting by Mr. Gamble called Spring Flowers. I'm very partial to his paintings. So as you sit comfortably, I invite you to consciously relax your whole body. 
and maybe softly scan your body. Are you holding any tension anywhere in your shoulders, in your neck? Just scan your body. Breathe into those areas. Maybe in your mind, just gently say to those areas, relax. In meditating, some say it works best to lightly close your eyes, shutting out any visual distractions and bringing your awareness inward. However, another approach to soften your gaze on this painting and just focus on it as you follow my voice. And now, let your breath relax you even further. Breathing in deeply to a count of four or five. Hold. And then release your breath to a count of of eight or 10. It's the exhale breath that relaxes your body. So just release that exhale breath at a long, slow pace. Breathing in, breathing out. Well, I, I invite you to imagine yourself sitting or maybe lying down in this beautiful field of poppies and lupins. Can you imagine a soft breeze gently on your face? Can you imagine feeling the warmth of the ground underneath your body? Listen. Can you hear the waves gently lapping at the shoreline? So as you sit here or lay here, I invite you to release the day. Our days can be so hectic. We all wear so many hats. We may seem to be so busy doing things for others. And yet each of you has had a beautiful full life a rich life, an unfolding story in itself. So right now, I invite you to relax and remember who you are, who you really are. And now move your focus to your heart and reflect on these words. Let my Words be your words as I speak. You are strong. You are curious. You are unique. You are courageous. It takes great courage to live our lives today in these complicating times. To stay centered. And now I invite you to 
Maybe place your hand lightly on your heart. Just soften your heart. With your next breath, breathe in tenderness and compassion. Maybe visualize someone you love, a partner, a family member, a child, a friend, a beloved pet. And then as you breathe out, breathe out love and gratitude. Breathing in tenderness and compassion. Breathing out love and gratitude. And now relax deeper into this supportive state of grace as I read to you a poem by Dana Folds called Walk Slowly. It only takes a reminder to breathe, a moment to be still, and just like that, something in me settles, softens, make space for imperfection. The harsh voice of judgment drops to a whisper and a ring and I remember again that life isn't a relay race, that we will all cross the finish line, that waking up to life is what we are born for. As many times as I forget, catch myself charging forward without even knowing where I'm going. That many times I can make the choice to stop, to breathe, and be, and walk slowly into the mystery. Yes, my friends, we can all make the choice to stop, to breathe, to be, and then to walk slowly into the mystery. Sometimes we just need to remind ourselves of that. Thank you, my friends, and namaste. And now, I invite you to just kind of bring yourself back into our space together. Thank you so much for joining Suzanne and I tonight. It's been a wonderful, wonderful journey. It has been. Thank you, Claudia. Mm -hmm. I, I always hate to interrupt. <laughs> I actually think I have one more slide, don't I, Suzanne? Oh, well, yeah, if you want to put it up, you can. It's on what's what's at the Crocker and what's coming to the Crocker. All right. And any any of you are in the area or just give me a message, an email, and I'll meet you and we can walk through together. Suzanne, before you start, you say we can meet you and walk through together. So are you there other days than Friday? I mean, how's that work? Um, I can be. <laughs> my regular tour schedule is Fridays, the first and third Fridays, 10 to 12. But I will be, if I can, I'll be happy to meet you. Uh, and we can go through and take a look at some of this wonderful art, especially some of these great uh, exhibits that are that are coming and are, and are here. And I think we've mentioned the candy store that's here. It's actually leaving Sunday. It was the last day, and uh, I had the pleasure of walking through it with Claudia and Lillian and Pam Hyde uh, a little while ago, before that, and it's funky. <laughs> it's funky, <laughs> and it makes you laugh. It does make you laugh. It is just a wonderful show that celebrates the area's uh, funk and nut artists. 
and uh, um, there's the ending of belonging, which was the National Council for Ceramic Education, and it is um, a, a really an amazing show of contemporary artists and what how they feel and but how they demonstrated their um, their concept of identity and belonging to a community and what it meant to them. Um, the starting let started last uh, Sunday. Oh, was it last Sunday? Yeah, yeah, last Sunday was uh, it, radiant and eternal. These are Chinese jades. And I have not seen that one yet. So I'll look forward to seeing that one tomorrow. Actually, I'm going to be at the Crocker. Where is the Chinese jade from? Uh, oh, that's Lucy. Um, I, you know, that's a good, I don't know all of it, but some are owned by the Crocker. They have actually a, a, a very selective, but nice um, collection of jade and a uh, collection of jade. And um, I think others are borrowed from either other uh, pro private donors, but I, you know, I'll find out a little bit more about that, but that is all through the summer. It doesn't leave until November. So we've got quite a while on that. And maybe one next more, month I'll put in a few question. pieces. There's, yeah, more, Lucy. Twinker Thibault. T is Twinka that, Thibault, yeah. Is that her, his daughter? Or yes, it that? is. Okay. Twinka Thibault is a um, professional uh, photographer's the model. Yeah. And uh, okay. this is a retrospective of her work. Uh, from the very first moment she started um, either modeling for her dad and then going to professional photographers to even last year when she was modeling. Um, an intriguing woman. And uh, it, will, it will dovetail nicely um, uh, with Wayne Tebow's celebration. He just passed away last year at 101. And... Uh, um, so that'll be a great dovetail. You know, you'll see the dad's work and then you'll see her work. And then in, uh, by the August, way, Dan, by the way, she is, uh, she was born in 1945. So she's 76 years old now. And she's still, and she's still model. She's oh. still modeling. And, the uh, modeling. what kind of modeling? Uh, uh, she's done nudes. She's done, um, most of her stuff is studio or outdoors modeling for photographers. So as you can see, this particular piece was a whole um, uh, series done by this particular artist of Twinka um, in different, using different mediums and different uh, like fabrics or plastics. And, and it's very, and this is actually quite recent. Oh my gosh, I just pulled up when Lucy asked one of her pictures and it is incredibly famous. I know many of you might have remembered it. It's called Imogene and what's it called? Imogene and the, and, the, um, and Twinka at Yosemite. Mm -hmm. And it's this old, older woman, white hair with this camera mm -hmm. and this very young, very slender, very nude woman both of them standing by a tree. And when we, we get off of this, I'll see if I can hold it up so you guys can see it, but you'll know it because it's, it's a very famous uh, you know, photograph. Oh, Claudia, the, uh, you, you mentioned nude. So that is one of the things that um, as we tour Twinka's exhibit, we have to make sure that we let people know there's a lot of uh, the exposed human body, if you will, there. And so it may not be appropriate for all audiences. Oh well, my gosh, how tastefully worded. Exposed <laughs> human body. Oh, well past that. that. <laughs> yeah, but you know, <laughs> yeah, but she, you know, she was, uh, she didn't have anything retouched. She, you know, even the photos I saw of her from a, a year ago or two years ago, you know, she says, I got a little pot belly and I got this and that's the way I am. Um, and, you know, we all are. <laughs> yeah, yeah. A little <laughs> saggy, a little saggy here. Uh, but that one that you mentioned, Claudia, Imogene is Imogene Cunningham, which who was a very famous art uh, photographer. And it was made to look like Imogene came across Twinka in uh um, Yosemite, but that was staged. That was that was a stage. Oh, of course. Uh, yeah. But 
but um, she was there, Twinkle was there doing quite a few uh, um, sets with the photographer there. And I'm I see she worked, she worked a lot with Ansel Adams as well. Yeah, some of his stuff too. She's worked with a lot of photographers. Her work, her, her you know, expanse of work is phenomenal. And uh, interesting, and she talks a lot about her dad, uh, about modeling for her dad or sitting, sitting and modeling for her dad. And she said that she would come home from school and she, would, she started, I think, as young as, Pam, do you remember as young as six, I think, she started modeling or maybe four, maybe it was four she started modeling. Yeah, I dad. don't remember the exact age, but she was a tot. She was yeah, very young. She started, and then she would um, he would pose her sometimes on some of the ones that you'll see in the show, uh, where she's posed on the floor. Oh. Uh, it doesn't look that you can't tell it, but that's how she is laying out, stretched out on the floor, and and for hours she would lay there for hours, or she would be posed for hours, and she said. It was it was great for her to um, to work with her dad. Um, he was a surprisingly a perfectionist, although he gave the illusion of being really laid back. But uh, Wayne Tebow was a perfectionist and uh, worked and reworked his uh, his portraits quite a bit. So I'm you know looking forward to seeing that. And I don't know if she's coming to talk or not. I've heard that she might be doing coming to speak at the uh, at the Crocker but I, I'm not I have to I'll have to dig in and, and see but I would imagine she's pretty interesting to listen to yeah and will you let us know I will I will you'll and have to come back Lucy you'll have to come back yeah yeah come and back so what? his his you know come back to art uh, cocktail mark talls yeah. well I was thinking of going there in person <laughs> oh good yes, I so. think that's even better Lucy so you, her show starts uh, mid-June and his show starts uh, next month, towards the end of the month. So they'll overlap quite nicely. And it's going to be nice to see some of Tebow's work coming back. It's been on tour for uh, two years, Pam, I think. It's, it's, some of his stuff has been gone for two years and now it's coming back and there'll be some other pieces added to it, which I'm looking forward to seeing. Okay, so you can see that, you know, there's some really fun, really fun pieces. And then there's our old favorites that I always like to go visit that are there in the permanent collection. So, all right. Thank you so much, Claudia. And Thank you, Suzanne. Thank you. Thanks, Melissa, for coming. It's good to see you. It's been a while. Good yeah. to see you. A month. It's been a month. <laughs> all right. Bye guys. Bye guys. All right. Bye-bye, Melissa. Bye, everyone. Okay. Bye. Thanks, Claudia. Thanks.